In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of thy faithful, and enkindle in them the fire of thy love. Send forth thy Spirit, and they shall be created, and thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who did instruct the hearts of the faithful by the light of the Spirit, grant us in the same Spirit to be truly wise and ever to rejoice in his consolation. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Today we consider our own sins. We continue week one of the spiritual exercises. And this purpose of week one, as we recall, is the consideration of sin and its consequences. This meditation follows number 55 to 61 of the spiritual exercises. And in this exercise, this meditation, everyone should diligently prepare to go to confession. And in this confession, we call this the general confession, a review of all the sins of my whole life. It should be accurate and it should be contrite from the depth of my heart. We want to unburden our hearts of anything that may cause doubt or anxiety. We begin with number 55, the preparatory prayer. I will beg God, our Lord, for grace that all my intentions, actions, and operations may be directed purely to the praise and service of his divine majesty. In the first prelude, we have the composition of place. So in our imaginations, we place in our minds the following circumstances. And here it is to, in our meditation on sin to have in our minds the representation of my soul as a prisoner in this corruptible body and to consider my whole being, body and soul, as an exile here on this earth. And I consider this for a minute or two and then I move on to the second prelude the petition for what I desire. And in this meditation, the petition is a growing and intense sorrow and tears for my own sins. This meditation has five points. The first point, the record of my sins, following number 56 of the spiritual exercises. Having considered sin, in others, in our last meditations, we must enter into our own souls and realize how sin has worked in them. It is a simple view of our past life, running through its stages, places where we have dwelt, offices, occupations that we have had, and our relationships with others. We must look at our soul as it truly stands before God. What we're seeking in this meditation is not simply a material examination of conscience, making sure that I get each and every last sin that I've committed. We're looking for something much more deeper, much more profound. And that is that we want to see the process of sin in our own lives, step by step. For instance, by recalling the sins that I have committed in the past, I can tell what caused a particular sin to happen, what consequences that it had, and so on. All my sins, in a certain way, are related to each other. And so we need to see the link that binds them in order to get rid of them completely by getting rid of the link. And here St. Ignatius says, I will call to mind 
all the sins of my life, reviewing year by year and period by period. Three things will help me in this. First, to consider the place where I lived. Secondly, my dealings with others. Thirdly, the offices I have held. The second point to consider is the gravity of my sins. And this follows from number 57 of the spiritual exercises. We want to consider sin in a number of different ways. First of all, we see that sin is a deformity. Sin is a disorder. It is ugliness in itself. For example, when we hear a note that's out of tune on a piano or other musical instrument, the reaction is natural. Everyone kind of cringes. And it is the same thing with sin. Sin is an offense against the harmony of creation. It is an attack on the essential order of how things should be on the greatness of God, on the dignity of human nature. Every disorder is ugly, and sin is the greatest disorder. When a human loses his reverence towards God, that person also loses his identity. How many men and women are deformed by sin? Sin is a deformity. The second consideration on sin is that sin is a sign of foolishness. Fools say in their hearts, there is no God, from Psalm 14. The foolish man thinks that nobody is aware of his sin. He thinks that nobody will take care of it. They say, the Lord does not see, the God of Jacob does not perceive. Understand, O dullest of the people, fools, when you will you be wise? He who planted the ear, does he not hear? He who formed the eye, does he not see? He who disciplines the nations, he who teaches knowledge to humankind, does he not chastise? Psalm 94. The sinner is a foolish person. That person doesn't recognize that God is looking at him and that God is, in a sense, laughing at him. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord has them in derision from Psalm 2. A third consideration on sin is that sin is a fountain of dissatisfactions. The sinner is never satisfied. By nature, sin demands more and more, again and again. Sin is like a spoiled child who keeps asking without ever becoming tired. The sinner will never be satisfied, and this is because sin brings a, only a relative happiness, not a perfect and pure happiness. It's a relative happiness because the happiness only lasts for a moment, and later on it disappears like an illusion. And it really is an illusion. Sin is the illusion of giving to what is temporal and limited the value of something infinite. Our souls were created for the infinite. The soul desires the infinite because God created it, and God is the only infinite. Consequently, there's no creature on the face of the earth that can satisfy completely the soul. Only God can satisfy the depths of the soul. So this third consideration is that sin is a fountain of dissatisfactions. 
A fourth consideration is that sin is, above all, an offense against God. And here we can consider the sin of King David. We see that we recall the, the story of King David, where he offended Bathsheba, wounding her honor. He also offended Uriah, Bathsheba's husband, first taking his wife and then later killing him. And King David also sinned because he offended his own people with his public sin. However, in Psalm 51, King David says, Against you, you alone have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you are justified in your sentence and blameless when you pass judgment. Sin is an obstacle placed between my soul and God. Sin is a stain. It defiles the sinner in his most intimate spiritual life, in that most intimate communion between the soul and God. And as I consider these four aspects of sin, I will weigh the gravity of my sins and see the loathsomeness and the malice which every mortal sin I have committed has in itself, even though it were not forbidden. The third point, number 58, is to consider who I am, to get perspective on who I am. And St. Ignatius says that I will consider who I am and by means of examples, humble myself. First of all, what am I compared with all men? Second, what are all men compared with all the angels and saints of paradise. Third, consider what all creation is in comparison with God. Then I alone, what can I be? Fourth, I will consider all the corruption and loathsomeness of my body. And lastly, I will consider myself as a source of corruption from which has issued countless sins and evils and the most offensive poison. And then after considering these five questions, I look at the whole of my sins from the first point, and we're called to repeat the words of St. Augustine, I beg you, God, Tell me where and when I was innocent. You, O oh Lord, forced me to look at myself, taking me from behind my back, where I, I had placed myself, unwilling to observe myself. You set me before my face, that I might see how foul I was. And I looked and stood terrified, and there was no escape for myself. After considering who I am with the gravity of my, of my sins, I now consider who God is in the fourth point, number 59. Let us now compare the reality of who I am, a sinner, with the reality of God. On the one side is the human being, conscious of what is good and what is evil, and also conscious of my own sin. And on the other side is our consciousness of the greatness and the holiness of God. And I now consider who God is against whom I have sinned, going through his glorious attributes and comparing them with their contraries in myself. I first consider God's wisdom compared to my ignorance. 
Secondly, I consider God's power compared to my weakness. Third, I consider the great justice of God, God's justice, compared to my iniquity. The last consideration is God's goodness compared to my wickedness from my sins. After this consideration, comparing the attributes of God with their contribution or with their contraries in me, I can ask myself, why did I do such a thing? Why did I think such a thing? Why did I speak such a thing? The very final point in today's meditation, the fifth point, we call a cry of wonder. Number 60. Before all my sins, I cry out in wonder, accompanied by surging emotion. And I try to encourage this emotion within my soul. As I pass in review all that has been created. How is it that creatures have been at my service? How is it that the angels, the swords of God's justice, not only have tolerated me, but have guarded me and prayed for me? Why have all the saints interceded for me and asked favors for me? Why have all of the things of creation, the heavens, the sun, the moon, the stars, the elements, the fruits, the birds, the fish, and all other animals been at my service? Why didn't the earth swallow me up for my sins? And here we can see from Psalm 51, that God is not only the judge who knows my sins even more so than I do, but he is at the same time the only one to whom man can cry. According to your abundant mercy, O Lord, blot out my transgressions. From Psalm 51. Create a, in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. Restore my joy. Create in me a pure heart. Lastly, we close with a colloquy. And here we ask for three graces. The first grace to ask for, a deep knowledge of my sins and a feeling of scorn and contempt for what I have done. Secondly, an understanding of the disorder of my actions, that being filled with horror for them, I may amend my life and put it in order. And lastly, I ask for a knowledge of the world, that filled with horror, I may put away from myself all that is vain. And after asking for these three graces, I make a threefold colloquy. First, to Our Lady, that she may obtain these three graces from her Son. And then I pray the Hail Mary. Second, I make a colloquy to Christ, that he may obtain these three favors from the Father for my soul. And then I pray the Anime Christi. And lastly, I make a colloquy to God the Father, that he may grant these favors to me. And I close with an Our Father. The Lord be with you and with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Thanks be to God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
As a reminder for this meditation, we want to recall how we want to be preparing for our general confession, to write down those sins of my life, going period by period and stage by stage, so that we are prepared to make the general confession. <laughs> 